Okay, as you see, today we will start the second um, chapter of our background information section, namely quantum mechanics for identical particles. This is a chapter which we also did in our quantum mechanics 2 lecture, and many of you have participated in that lecture. If you haven't, then uh, this is of course also standard material which is treated in every quantum mechanics book or advanced quantum mechanics book. And what we want to do today is uh, to show that uh, this treatment that is typical in quantum mechanics approaches is actually already a quantum field theory. So our section today will provide like a bridge between ordinary quantum mechanics for one particle and uh, our quantum field theory treatment and in the middle sits this treatment for identical particles with a Fox space and uh, certain operators that are typical in this procedure as we will discuss today. So as a motivation, let me say again uh, one physics question, almost a philosophical question that you can ask yourself. If you have here, let's say, an experiment on the Earth uh, where some experimentalist is analyzing some electrons which fly around in the lab. The electron has certain properties, uh, masses, charges, and so on. On the other hand, uh, here is the moon and here there are also electrons, then what quantum mechanics seems to tell us is that those two electrons are absolutely identical. Their properties are 100% the same. You could not distinguish between the two electrons with none experiment that anybody could invent. It's a mathematical uh, identity between those two particles. That is what we call identical particles and it's an observational fact that uh, electrons behave in this way. All electrons are identical in the sense that no experiment can distinguish between electrons and you cannot put an identity like electron A, electron B to the particles. But uh, the state which you obtain by exchanging two electrons is exactly the same state as you had before. And this is something that you could not have expected from classical mechanics where every particle has an identity which is for example defined by its trajectory which you can always distinguish from the trajectory of other particles. And uh, so you might ask yourself how does nature manage to create such absolutely identical particles? Why do they exist? I mean, they don't have to exist. Our quantum mechanical formalism allows for them. We observe that they exist, but uh, quantum mechanics could also live without the existence of such identical particles. So one question that you can have is, how does nature actually arrange such identical particles? And at the end of the section, we are able to give at least one possible answer um, in terms of quantum field theory. But let us begin with uh, a repetition of quantum mechanics 2, construction of a multiparticle theory. So we begin with a single particle theory. And as a single particle theory, we take something which is familiar from ordinary quantum mechanics treatments, namely a theory for a non-relativistic particle in three dimensions, which is uh, given by some Hamiltonian, H. And for the time being, I use a hat for operators. Uh, so the operator H is given by non-relativistic P squared divided by 2M plus a potential V which typically depends on the X operator. So that is our uh, quantum mechanical single particle theory for a non-relativistic particle in three dimensions.
All right. What one always has to do in a quantum mechanical treatment is uh, you need operators, but uh, the operators need to act on something, namely on the Hilbert space of physical states. So we need a basis of our Hilbert space of physical states. And here I will provide you with several bases of our Hilbert space of states. Let us call the Hilbert space of states uh, curly H. And at the moment, it is a one particle state because we are still in the single particle theory, so I call it H1. Is there a problem? No. Uh, not enough light or? Maybe a little bit upwards. Okay. Uh, so, basis of our Hilbert space of states. So, one uh, very useful basis is the basis in terms of momentum eigenstates. Let's call them uh, P. Okay, that would be one basis. And uh, let's not write lots of uh, symbols here. You know uh, what we mean when we uh, write down those states. They are eigenstates of the momentum operator with eigenvalue P in three dimensions. An alternative basis of the same Hilbert space would be one in terms of position eigenstates. Uh, position eigenstates are denoted as x vector and they are eigenstates of the position operator x hat with eigenvalue x. Third, uh, there could be a basis in terms of energy eigenstates. For example, let me call them here En. They are eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. with eigenvalue en, obviously. Okay. And there might be discrete eigenvalues or continuous eigenvalues. We don't know about that. And uh, sometimes the momentum eigenstates are at the same time also energy eigenstates. And sometimes they are not. For example, if the potential is zero, uh, we have a free particle. And then momentum eigenstates are automatically also energy eigenstates, but in general, uh, they are different, but anyway, we can have a basis of our Hilbert space in terms of all of those eigenstates, and there are infinitely more choices of possible bases of our Hilbert space. Okay, then we can now. Uh, okay, yes. Just a question regarding the eigenvalues of the eigenvectors. So we have several eigenvectors with the same eigenvalue. Then. Um, for the momentum operator, not because uh, all three dimensions uh, are independent, so they are not degenerate, but the energy eigenstates often are degenerate. For example, in the free particle case, as you probably imagine, if you have free particles, then um, the energy depends on p vector square over 2m, of course, and so we have a degeneracy. And then uh, we might need here some additional labels, which I suppress. That's completely right. Or uh, the label might be such that uh, n is the label of the basis states, but en might have the same value for some different n, which corresponds to your degeneracies. So that's absolutely allowed. But regardless of degeneracy of op uh, operator eigenvalues, uh, we always know that the eigenstates of a Hermitian operator form a complete basis. And we can choose them also uh, orthogonally. And that's what we assume here. Now, uh, that ends our discussion of the single particle theory. And then we can go to the multi-particle theory, which we do by a postulate. And this is an additional postulate of the quantum theory in agreement with such, such observations. Namely, actually, um, we would now postulate that uh, there is not only um, the possibility of have a single uh, particle of that type, but actually um, this particle defines 
uh, something like what we would call a particle type, a type of particle, and this particle type can exist once or it can exist twice or three times. There can exist a multitude of particles of this very same type, and we want to describe all states with uh, arbitrarily high numbers of particles of this uh, particular type. And so that is a postulate. There exist multi-particle states for indistinguishable particles. of this particular type and an important um, sub postulate is that the states describing these multi-particle um, systems are completely symmetric or completely anti-symmetric in exchange of the different particles. The states are completely symmetric or anti-symmetric. And if they are completely symmetric, the particles are called bosons. If they are completely anti-symmetric, the particles are called fermions. And uh, in this lesson today, we only consider uh, the bosonic case. So we today assume that our states are always completely symmetric. But that is just to be concrete, not because uh, the fermionic case couldn't be treated, it could be in the same way. Then we have a new Hilbert space of states. And this space has a new name, namely it is called a Fox space. A Fox space is a space which we obtain by going from the single particle to a multi-particle theory and its basis is constructed in the following way. And let's only do it for the momentum basis. We, we could do it in a similar way for all the other basis choices of the single particle state. Namely, we have the state which we call zero, which is the vacuum which contains no particle. We have all the states that we had before, all the single particle states, and as I said, we use here the momentum basis. We also have two particle states, which in the momentum basis we write with two labels, P1, P2, and they are totally symmetrized. So if you remember quantum mechanics 2, at some point we also dealt with an unsymmetrized two-particle Hilbert space, but in this Fox space only the symmetrized spaces appear. So only such states exist. The state where the order matters, it just doesn't exist at all in our description. So this would be two-particle states and so on, up to infinity. And uh, the linear combination, um, or the, the uh, possible linear combinations of all those states form our complete Hilbert space. That is the definition of a Fox space. And so we can write it uh, symbolically that our new Hilbert space H, the Fox space, is a direct sum of all these individual Hilbert spaces of the Hilbert space H0 for the uh, vacuum state plus the Hilbert space H1 for the single particle states plus Hilbert space H2 plus for the symmetrized two particle states plus and so on. Symmetrized three particle states and so on up to infinity. That is the formula for our Hilbert space, which uh, summarizes what I said here before.
Now, how can we do quantum mechanics on that Hilbert space? Well, uh, we need operators like Hamiltonian and uh, other operators of interest. And it turns out that it's very useful and very efficient to introduce a particular new set of operators which is adapted to the fact that our states uh, can now have arbitrary numbers of particles. And so the efficient operators are creation and annihilation operators, which we can define. A creation operator is something which uh, produces out of um, a certain state another state with one particle more. Annihilation operator is one which uh, removes one particle. And so with these creation and annihilation operators, we can go between these different n particle subspaces, and they are very useful. So let us define them. They are just an efficient tool which automatically arises here once we have those states. So that is not a new postulate, but uh, automatically once we have those states, we can define these operators. Uh, and by the way, let me just add here the remark. Choose P and we could also with all the other bases. So that is just our choice to uh, write something concrete. And uh, OK, so for this concrete choice of momentum basis, we write here our creation operator in this way. A dagger with subscript P vector. This is a creation operator which creates an additional particle with momentum P in the momentum eigenstate. And uh, so this operator is a mapping from a subspace of the symmetrized n-particle Hilbert space to the symmetrized n plus 1 particle Hilbert space. And how does it act? It acts in the following way. If you take this creation operator and let it act on a state where you have already n particles with momenta p1 up to pn, and that state is symmetrized. Then the operator is defined uh, such that the result of the operation gives you a normalization factor times the state where the momentum p is added to the list. The result is still symmetrized by definition. And the prefactor is the same as in the harmonic oscillator creation operator, square root of n plus 1. Okay. So in this way, you have defined this creation operator for any basis state, and therefore you have defined it uh, on the entire Hilbert space of states. Once you have defined this uh, creation operator A dagger, you can also define the corresponding operator without dagger by daggering it. So we can then define A of P without dagger, which is obviously defined as this daggered and uh, is unambiguously defined. And uh, therefore, we do not have to write down how it acts, because you can completely reconstruct the action of the annihilation operator from the action of the creation operator. And uh, the only relationship which I will write down, say it fits over there, is uh, the action of the annihilation operator on the vacuum. Namely, what happens if you act with an annihilation operator onto the vacuum. Then uh, you obtain the action by daggering the previous expression and you see that if you act with a dagger on anything, you will always obtain a state with at least one particle. Therefore the vacuum can never be the result of a dagger acting on anything. And that means if you act with A on the vacuum, you get the zero vector. 
so you get zero. And that is something that you can also use as the definition of the vacuum in many cases. So, and another important relation is that you see that if you start from the vacuum and act with a decker, you get one particle state. If you act with a decker once again, you get two particle states and so on. So ultimately you can reconstruct all states of your Hilbert space by acting sufficiently many times with a decker onto the vacuum. All states in H uh, are obtained from, let's say, a decker P1 Decker Pn acting on the vacuum. So that clearly shows you uh, that these operators are very useful and uh, you can obtain all states from them and that also means um, you can obtain all operators from uh, the A's and A deckers or in other words you can write uh, all operators purely in terms of A and A deckers if you wish to do so and often that's useful. So then you do a small computation and uh, we don't do it here but uh, you do it in quantum mechanics or in exercises and then you obtain the uh, commutation relation. So for example you can take two different creation or annihilation operators A of P and A of P prime and you see that they commute, the commutator of two different ones is zero and on the other hand if you take one annihilation operator and one creation operator A and A dagger then the commutator is non-zero but in fact it's given by a delta function. In general the commutator would be the same as the scalar product between the matrix element or between the two uh, corresponding eigenstates and uh, a typical normalization of that scalar product is a three-dimensional delta function P minus P prime. So you see uh, the commutation relations of A and A dagger are similar to the ones that you have in the harmonic oscillator, namely for every P it's actually really the same up to the fact that we have here continuously many and therefore uh, if you have p equal to p prime you do not get one but you would get infinity that is just because we have a continuous um, continuum index okay so this is an important property for the a's and let us then make explicit what I just said before, namely all operators can actually be completely expressed in terms of A and A decker. So let us write that down, how it looks like for a few typical kinds of operators. So as I said, all operators can be expressed in terms of A's and A daggers and let us do it for what is called one particle operators first. What are one particle operators? One particle operators are operators which uh, even in a multi-particle state only act on one of the n particles at a time. And those are precisely the only operators which exist in the original single particle theory. If you have a single particle theory, every operator acts precisely on this single particle and on nothing else. So those operators from the single particle theory 
still exist in the multiparticle theory also and they are interesting and important and they have the effect that they individually act on the first particle, then on the second, then on the third and so on, but they only act on one particle at a time. And uh, they uh, should now be expressed in terms of A's and A daggers. So let us define such a single particle operator. It is initially defined on the single particle theory only and in order to define it we can write down its matrix elements for example in our basis of momentum eigenstates. So initially let's call it T, so a single particle operator for me is now called T. Uh, so we know for example how T acts on any basis state P prime, uh, the P. So how does it act on any basis state? So in general, we can write the result in the following way as an integral d3 p prime and then we add here this uh, operation which is the um, unit operator on the single particle Hilbert space t p okay. And then you see that what we have here on the right is the matrix element of the operator T between two basis states P and P prime. And then we just write this result in that way. So where we have defined the abbreviation T with two indices corresponding to the matrix element uh, between those two basis states. And so what that tells you is that we have now completely characterized the operator on the single particle space by numbers, namely by its matrix elements between arbitrary single particle basis states. And then if you act on any basis state, you get a linear combination of basis states uh, uh, modulated by these matrix elements. So this completely characterizes a single particle operator and now we want to express this operator on our multi-particle theory and for that we can define an expression in terms of A's and A daggers, namely let us define T is defined as the following D3P prime D3P and then the matrix element T P prime T P times A decker of P prime times A without decker uh, P. This is our definition. And now without calculation, because that is quantum mechanics 2 material, you can immediately check that if we, you apply this operation onto that basis state, it uh, gives you exactly the same result as before. Therefore, this operation reproduces the original definition of the single particle operator everywhere where it was initially defined. But this uh, object here is defined on the full Fox space. You can apply this operation now on any basis state with arbitrarily many particles. You can also apply it onto the vacuum and uh, therefore this is now defined on the full Fox space. So it reproduces, uh, let's call this here star, it reproduces star but is defined on the full Fox space. And the physical meaning is what I said before. So if you take an n particle space like this one here or that one and you act with it, uh, with that T on that state, then what you get is uh, T first acts on the P1 state plus P acts on the P2 state plus and so on up to P act, uh, T acts on the Pn state. So you get uh, simply the action of the T on every particle individually added up. 
So that is a single particle operator and you can do this for all operators which were defined in the original theory like also for the Hamiltonian or other important operators. But in the multi-particle theory more is possible. We do not only have to have single particle operators where all the particles uh, are independent but we can now connect two particles and you might want to do that. For example, you might be interested in the Coulomb interaction between two electrons. And then you might want to have an operator which describes this Coulomb interaction between uh, pairs of electrons. Um, and uh, that would not be a single particle operator but you need two particle operators for that. So such two particle operators are a new thing which are uh, physically obviously important and they are initially not defined on our single particle theory but they could be defined on uh, a two particle Hilbert space and uh, the simplest way to define them would be even on the two particle space where we have not yet done the symmetrization. No plus. Okay. So if we define them initially on that space, then we can define them also via matrix elements and so we would have a matrix element like this with four indices, P1 prime, P2 prime and P1, P2 and this matrix element would be a matrix element of an operator which I call W hat which is defined on a two particle Hilbert space. So it's a matrix element and on the left we have a two particle state with P1 prime, P2 prime and on the right we have a two particle state with P1, P2. And such operators uh, can exist, they can be defined and as I said a good example would be the Coulomb interaction between those two particles. And then we get such matrix elements as well and once we have those matrix elements we can again <coughs> define the analogous expression. We can define W hat, okay let me add here hats, T hat as well. W hat is now defined as a fourfold integral with a factor one half for a symmetrization. So we have D3 P1 prime d3 p2 prime d3 p1 d3 p2 and then obviously the matrix element <coughs> w p1 prime p2 prime p1 p2 and then a's and a daggers first a dagger p1 prime a dagger p2 prime and then two a's but here uh, the order is interesting. What one needs in general is uh, the opposite order A, P2, A, P1. So here the order is flipped. That is actually not important for bosons but it is important for fermions. So, but that is also something that we have derived in our quantum mechanics 2 lecture and again the same statement is true. It reproduces the correct behavior on the two particle state but it is valid um, as an operator on the full Fox space and you can apply it to any state on the Fox space. If you apply it to the vacuum it gives zero because of the A's. If you apply it to a one particle state it also gives zero because of the two A's here. But if you apply it to a two particle state or higher then you get something non-trivial and you get the expected behavior. Okay and so with all of this in mind we can now write our new Hamiltonian for the multiparticle theory.
which is H hat is uh, first a kinetic term D3P. So instead of our familiar P square over 2M, we now have a P square over 2M times A dagger of P times A of P. Okay. That is our kinetic energy operator. And why is that? Because initially uh, our kinetic operator was just P square over 2M with a momentum operator. Then what you need to do is take the matrix element of that between two momentum eigenstates. That matrix element gives you then the number P square over 2M and the delta function between P prime and P. So then you go here, you have the number P square over 2M and the delta function between P prime and P. So one integral get, gets cancelled, <coughs> P prime becomes equal to P and therefore you obtain this expression, the number P square over 2M times A dagger A with the same P. And only one integral instead of two. That simply means that uh, the kinetic energy operator is diagonal in momenta because momentum eigenstates are also kinetic energy eigenstates. So that is the kinetic energy. And how about the potential energy? This is not diagonal in uh, momentum eigenstates. Therefore, we have the full expression here and we just insert here the matrix element for uh, the potential energy. So let's say V P prime P A dagger P prime a of P. Question I mentioned now a few times Coulomb potential or Coulomb uh, interaction between different particles. Uh, this potential here, can this not be the Coulomb interaction? What is the meaning of this potential that we have here that we already had in the single particle theory and that has now this expression? What could be a physics example of that? Yeah? yeah it's an external potential, like an electric field or something. Right. It's an external potential which does not come from one particle to the next, but which is switched on already in the single particle theory, externally, exactly like you say, and then each particle feels that external potential in the same way. So it could be yeah, some completely homogeneous or inhomogeneous external magnetic or electric field or something like that. But you cannot describe with this the interaction between pairs of particles. Okay, but first let's interpret this. So uh, we have come from our single particle theory, then we went through all those steps, and what do we now have? We have multi-particle states of identical particles. And why do we have it? Because we postulated it. Then the particles are all independent of each other. So this uh, thing here does not contain any interactions between two particles. Every particle only feels the external potential but the particles do not know anything about uh, all the other particles. That is what is described here. So they are completely independent. They interact, as we just discussed, with uh, an external potential. They all interact with the external potential in the identical way. And what is now nice to know on the subspace for a single particle, this theory is completely identical to the theory that we started with. Okay. 
So in this way you see how you can take a single particle theory, extend it to a multi-particle theory, but uh, in the original situation uh, your extension remains completely unchanged. That is important to know. Now let me just uh, squeeze here a final remark. So there is a, now a new possibility which we already alluded to and uh, this possibility is often important, namely you can now add these interactions between different particles like Coulomb interaction between particles and how would you do that? You would do it by adding to the Hamiltonian something like this. If you add to the Hamiltonian an operator like this which connects pairs of particles then you can describe additional uh, interparticle interactions. So you would replace your Hamiltonian by a sum of the single particle Hamiltonian plus such a two particle operator then you can describe for example Coulomb interactions between particles. And that is of course important. Okay, so this is the status uh, more or less that we have reached in our quantum mechanics 2 study. Maybe we did a little bit more, but that is essentially the step from single particle to multi-particle theory. And now let us uh, look at this result with new eyes uh, forming a bridge between this and quantum field theory. So actually, um, two years ago when I did the quantum mechanics 2 lecture, I spent a lot of time, actually three entire lectures were devoted to this interplay or interface between quantum mechanics and quantum field theory. So this is on the uh, YouTube videos from two years ago. So if you want more details that we can cover today, you can also watch those videos. And uh, what I will give you now in the next uh, half hour or so is a summary of this. Okay, so let us now interpret the same result as a quantum field theory. And uh, so in very loose terms a quantum field theory is simply a quantum theory where the basic operators are depending on x. The basic operators are function of x and so let us bring here uh, into the game some operators which depend on x and that is very simple because we simply have to go from the momentum uh, basis to the x basis. So let us uh, choose the x basis. And uh, first write down some relationships. So clearly one relationship that you are familiar with is uh, this one here. If you have a momentum eigenstate and you look at its wave function in X space, then this corresponds to that scalar product. Then this is uh, E to the I P dot X. And a good normalization would be one over uh, square root of 2 pi cubed and uh, this corresponds of course to having that the momentum operator in um, the x basis corresponds to minus i uh, nabla. Right? Minus i nabla is the momentum operator in uh, position or in, in x representation and uh, that corresponds to this scalar product between momentum eigenstates and position eigenstates. And conversely, uh, previously we had position eigenstates created by uh, creation operators A dagger. 
and how therefore uh, a position eigenstates related to x eigenstates. Okay, so we can of course here insert something like a one d three x. Uh, no, sorry, d three p. Then x uh, p. Um, sorry, what do we need to do? Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, okay, so if we integrate like this, then this here is the unit operator. We act with it on x. And so then we have here uh, the opposite scalar product. And therefore, our x uh, eigenstates are given by d3p times e to the minus i p dot x divided by square root um, of 2 pi cubed times a position, uh, so a momentum eigenstate. Okay, so this is a, another equivalent relationship between x eigenstates and momentum eigenstates. They are basically Fourier transformations of each other. And so now this is created by the creation operator A decker of P, and that should be created by a creation operator A decker of X. And so therefore we now know how the appropriate creation operators are related, namely by the same relationship. And so uh, this uh, defines also something like a decker of x creation operators for those x states. And now uh, we will introduce, however, a new notation for those operators in x space. And that is simply ad hoc. Let us use the following more complicated notation. Namely, instead of a decker of x, we write psi decker of x, which, however, really means what we normally would call a decker of x. So we introduce this uh, maybe nicer notation. And similarly, psi without decker of x is defined as what we normally would call A of x. So we just introduced this more explicit symbolic notation for our creation and annihilation operators for momentum eigenstates. And then this statement over here tells us that we have the following relationship for psi of x, which is really A of x. And it is connected uh, with um, A of p by this relationship, but we have to dagger the relationship and then we get d3p times 1 over 2 pi to the power 3 over 2 times e to the plus i p dot x times a of p. So we simply define creation operators for position eigenstates, they are related in this way to the uh, A's and A deckers of momentum eigenstates. And they are operators which depend on X. So they have the form of what we would call a field operator. They are field operators. So in that sense, uh, of course, since our whole discussion of the previous section was in principle, doable for any basis, we could immediately have done it for the x basis and uh, then we would have immediately obtained the field theory. Now we have to uh, go through a few additional steps. So what are the properties of those field operators psi of x, in other words, for creation operators of position eigenstates? Well, let's first compute the commutation relations. And, uh, but of course we don't compute them, we I just write down the result. You can do the computation on your own. So if you have this operator, psi of x, and you do a commutation relation with psi at y, it's analogous to having uh, two creation operators for p, p and p prime, and the commutator was zero, and it's also zero here. So they commute. What, however, happens if we have psi of x and psi dagger 
of y. Then this is like A and A dagger commutation relation. And it's not zero, but instead it's again a delta function. And here it's a delta function, three-dimensional delta function of x minus y. So these are the fundamental commutation relations which uh, follow immediately from the orthogonality of the corresponding basis states, x and y states. And they are completely uh, equivalent to the corresponding relations in momentum space. And you can also explicitly compute it. So uh, that means our field operators are not um, completely arbitrary functions of x, but they have an important property which has also uh, important physical implications. Namely, they are local in the sense that if you take two of them at different positions, they commute. So they would correspond to independent observables which do not speak to each other. And so this is a local operator which is um, uh, reminding you of this discussion that we had at the very beginning of the semester where we wanted to have local observables also in view of relativity. So this is not relativistic, but nevertheless, we get here local field operators. So then we have a relationship between our a of p from before and our new psi of x. Very simple relationship, really just a Fourier transform. And so now all operators which we had previously represented in terms of the a's, we can of course now uh, equivalently represent in terms of the psi's. It's just a matter of a small computation, inserting some Fourier transformations. And so in particular, we can do it for the Hamiltonian. So what happens if you represent the Hamiltonian uh, in terms of the size instead of in terms of A of P's? So one has to look at the original um, relationship. So let's say maybe I um, just write it down once more. So it was D3P and then the number, let me write it like this, A dagger of P, then a number P square over 2M a of p and then plus a double integral d3p d3p prime times a dagger p prime a of p and our potential matrix element v p prime and p. That was on the previous blackboard. And now you can represent this in terms of the psi. What happens? You insert here a of p the inverse Fourier transformation, then you get lots of integrals over all sorts of variables. But in the end, uh, all the integrals become delta functions, very simple integrals. You just insert everything. And uh, what simply happens is the following. A, so you get, let's say, Fourier transformation, work it out at home. And one noteworthy thing is that also in terms of the Fourier transformation, a momentum variable gets replaced by minus i times a derivative. And so in particular, this variable p square in a p integral becomes a derivative with respect to x in the corresponding x integral. This is always the effect of a Fourier transformation. So if you go through a few steps, then you obtain that the Hamiltonian now is the following x integral d3x and here instead of a dagger a you have psi dagger psi psi dagger of x and psi of x and in between you do not have p square a number but instead you have minus i nabla square so you have a derivative operator you have minus laplace divided by 2m so the derivative acts on this field operator here. And then you get an integral. And that is now our expression for the kinetic energy operator. Then this potential actually simplifies because the potential had matrix elements which were off diagonal in momentum space. But in position space, the potential is diagonal actually. So uh, instead of a double integral, 
we now get only a single integral, so we can put everything under one integral and we only get psi decker of x times the number v of x times psi of x. That's all. That is our single particle Hamiltonian written uh, with creation and annihilation operators for position eigenstates or in other words our Hamiltonian written in terms of quantum field operators. Okay. And you see here uh, this typical operation which you are familiar with from the Schrödinger equation in position space and here you just have a number v but everything is multiplied here with operators, with field operators which are really non-trivial operators depending on x. Now um, I want to show you a relationship and I hope it clarifies things or avoids misunderstandings instead of producing misunderstandings uh, because in quantum mechanics there are many many things called Psi and here we have now something called Psi and from quantum mechanics 1 of course you know also lots of things called Psi of X what are those normally? Those were wave functions wave functions for uh, states, single particle states in position space, right? So your psi of x was a wave function, a number valued wave function which described a single state of a certain quantum particle and the state was described in position space. That was your notion of psi of x. This psi of x is something entirely different. It's first of all an operator and it is not specific to any state. It's one universal operator which uh, is whatever it is, it's this and it has uh, no dependence on what state it acts on, it's just an operator. And so uh, let's keep this distinction in mind, but on the other hand there is a relationship between the two objects called Psi. Note the following relation to quantum mechanics 1 wave functions. So let's take a single particle state, let me call it now N to uh, symbolize that it's neither position nor momentum eigenstate, it can be any uh, state which therefore has a complicated wave function and uh, the wave function is given by the scalar product of that state with position eigenstates X and uh, it gives a wave function which I now call psi n of x. So that is the wave function specific to the state n. It has a certain value. Let's say harmonic oscillator wave function would be given by Hermit polynomials and so on. So this might be some Hermit polynomial. All right. And uh, so what is the relationship between this and our field operator? There is the following relationship. Namely, you can now write down the following matrix element. This. You have here our single particle state. Then you act with it with our, uh, you, you act on it with our new field operator which contains an annihilation operator for particles at position X. This thing. And then you do a scalar product with a vacuum state. What is the result of this matrix element? So this is really a quantum mechanical matrix element and you can actually calculate it. So do it. Yeah. Okay, but why? Right, exactly, that is the point. So this combination here if you flip it around and decker it, you see that it's actually a Psi decker acting on the vacuum. Gives a position eigenstate. So that is nothing but this and therefore it reproduces your beloved uh, quantum mechanics one wave function. So this is the relationship. 
Therefore, you see that this field operator here is a universal operator. It has certain properties. It's defined with no reference to any particular state. But its single particle uh, matrix elements, they contain uh, the information that you are familiar with from uh, the position space wave functions. So this is a connection that is useful to know. It's also one of those connections which form a bridge between quantum field theory and uh, ordinary single particle quantum mechanics. So let's, uh, that is not so important, this is only for the calculation, but let's uh, note here, this is a field operator, which is of course an operator and therefore it is, the operator itself is independent of the states but it acts on states, of course, but the operator itself is independent of the states and this is a wave function specific to the state n in this case. So, but the difference is now that this field operator psi it does not have to act on single particle states only. You can act with this psi of x on any multi-particle state as well. And then you get just some complicated object which you cannot interpret as such a single particle wave function. Therefore, uh, this is a much more general object, but in one specific application it reproduces something that you know, but it's defined in much wider circumstances also. So let us go on a little bit more and uh, then also on Thursday we have a little bit more time. We have now basically seen the following. To summarize what we did, we started with the single particle theory then we invented a postulate which was that multi-particle states should exist. They should be bosonic, they should uh, be formulated on a Fox space and then we uh, invented tools and methods. We invented operators A and A dagger, Psi and Psi dagger to describe our new system which follows from this postulate. We could also describe operators like the Hamiltonian in this formalism. And after doing all that, we discovered that this multiparticle theory, which follows from the postulate, actually is a quantum field theory because it can be entirely described in terms of such quantum field operators, which are operators which depend on X, which have local commutation relations and even the Hamiltonian and therefore really all important operators can be completely written in terms of our quantum field operators. So we really have a quantum field theory. But we didn't start with it, it's the outcome. And now I want to show you something, namely the same quantum field theory can also be obtained in a different way, namely we can start by a completely different uh, starting point, maybe you could also call it a postulate. We postulate in the beginning that we have immediately a field theory, but we can already start with a classical field theory and then uh, quantize that classical field theory and obtain all of those aspects the quantized field theory will automatically lead to operators like A and A dagger. It will also lead to the existence of multi-particle states. They must be bosonic and as a special case it contains our initial one-particle theory as well. But the starting point and the philosophy would therefore be very different and so let me now propose uh, to study briefly this uh, starting point. We postulate uh, field theory. Of 
quantize it and then everything follows and uh, one thing which is in particular noteworthy and which is maybe the new element from this new viewpoint is that the uh, existence of identical particles which are completely indistinguishable and which must be described by a Fox space with completely symmetrized states only that is a necessary consequence of this field theory starting point. So the existence of identical particles and therefore a Fox space is a consequence of the field theory starting point. And that is of course interesting because if you uh, remember the initial question of today, why and how does nature arrange that electrons on Earth and electrons on the Moon are absolutely identical and cannot be distinguished by any experiment, not even by a thought experiment, then the answer could be to say, okay, we uh, start from the assumption that nature is described by a field theory or fundamental objects in nature are fields, quantum fields, and then uh, uh, all of that is a necessary outcome, a necessary consequence. So it gives you an understanding of this observational fact. And uh, so let us just do this, but I think time is not sufficient to do it completely today, but let me at least start a little bit. And the starting point of the field theory is a classical field theory, so we do not immediately work in a quantum setting, but we first work on a classical setting where we have number valued fields and no operators. And then uh, theory is defined by a Lagrangian, which gives rise to equations of motion for the classical field. And uh, then on the classical level, we can go from the Lagrangian to a Hamiltonian. And then we can do a quantization procedure where we basically have a correspondence principle, the so-called canonical quantization, where a classical Hamiltonian, which depends on coordinates and momenta, is replaced by a quantum Hamiltonian, where all the objects are operators and satisfy certain commutation relations. So therefore, the starting point is a Lagrangian L. And in a field theory, we always or mostly write uh, the Lagrangian in terms of a Lagrangian density. So the Lagrangian function is a d3x integral over some density, which I always write with this curly L. So this is a local Lagrangian density. And uh, normally, when we are a little bit more experienced, we will only deal with this curly L and we will just call it Lagrangian. So, and uh, the Lagrangian which uh, we start with is the following i times psi star times psi dot uh, minus 1 over 2m times absolute value of nabla psi square. And uh, in brackets, let me say minus v times uh, psi absolute value square. Um, I write it in brackets because we will from now on drop this term and only deal with the first line. So that will be dropped only for simplicity of writing. but it could be treated in the same way. So that is our Lagrangian density and uh, that I, I drop from the sky and uh, this is now our postulate. Uh, nature would be described by this Lagrangian and uh, we have to go through the usual algorithm um, which brings us from here to a full quantum theory. And uh, that algorithm um, 
uh, can be done. It's straightforward, but it takes a little bit more than 10 minutes. Uh, therefore, um, we will not do it completely today, but we will continue on Thursday. Mm. Let me give you some remarks and then we can start today five minutes with the exercise sheet. And uh, the remarks are the following. So there is here a subtlety. Subtlety. So this Lagrangian is complex. That is a subtlety. So you see here, uh, that is a complex expression and uh, there is not the counterpart for it. So the Lagrangian is complex. However, if you integrate over it and apply partial integration, then the action is actually not complex. The imaginary part drops out because it's a total derivative and so once you integrate, uh, the thing becomes real, but the Lagrangian, first of all, is complex. And so then, in order to treat it, we need to treat Psi and Psi star as independent canonical variables. And uh, because the Lagrangian is complex, they will not behave in the completely identical way. And uh, I refer again to this paper, HEP PH0301052. It's also written on the exercise sheet. And uh, so therefore there are some subtleties in the canonical formalism for various treatments. As I already said the last time in this, uh, if you have the so-called constraints, um, the procedure going from the Lagrangian to the Hamiltonian is a little bit uh, more complicated than in the standard case. And here we have constraints and uh, these various treatments here uh, deal with the constraints in different ways and most of the ways and also the way that we will do here is kind of a dirty trick which leads you to the correct answer quite quickly. However, uh, there is a much cleaner procedure which is also much more complicated and uh, you can find all the details of that in this paper. Okay, so let us end here and then discuss a little bit the exercise sheet.